Hello everyone and welcome to Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well in these very difficult times. I sincerely do. Uh, today I want to talk to you about software architecture, which is a challenging thing to talk about. To be honest, this is the lecture of all the lectures about software engineering that I do that I enjoy the least because in spite of everyone's assurances, I'm not sure I believe there's any very sensible way to teach software architecture very much. So what I'm going to concentrate on today is just sort of reviewing some things that are in the book, talking about some basic ideas of software design, because I think design is the uh, key idea here, and sort of getting you set up so that you can start thinking about a topic that will be a thing that you'll encounter on and off throughout your software engineering career. So let's start with sort of a leftover topic. So this textbook that we're using for our course tends to lump the illities in with design, which is, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of my colleagues in the past, are the wrong place for them. Illities are requirements. And it's important, I think, to understand why the illities are requirements, and that's because if you treat them as the book does, as cross-cutting features that are blah, 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 what happens is that you can waste an awful lot of time overdoing them. It's really, really easy to rabbit hole on anything that you're putting into the software because it's good, because it's part of some nebulous quality, rather than because it needs to be in there for a reason. So let's look at some of the illities that the book lists. Responsiveness, that is, the system will react in a reasonable amount of time to your requests. Reliability, that is, the service will keep doing behaving as it's supposed to over time and under load. Availability, the system will function when the user needs it to function. Security, the system will be resistant to bad actors trying to make it do the wrong thing. Usability, the system will be friendly to good actors who are trying to use it in good conscience. Maintainability, that is, as changes are needed or bugs need to be fixed, new requirements are added, whatever happens, you it, it's straightforward to deal with that. And finally, resilience, the idea that it will keep operating well under a variety of conditions and that sort of thing. All of these are sort of related. There's not really eight categories here, or seven, whatever it is we've listed. There's really only a few, but, you know, big ones, and they sort of are broken down in interesting ways. But the thing with all of these is that all of these could be over-engineered, just like any other requirement. Your goal should be, look, building software is the hardest thing people do, and your goal as a software architect should be to build the simplest, smallest, easiest to build system that meets requirements. That should be your goal. No one in the real world gives you brownie points for bu building a system that's extra. And one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to try to build an extra system because it's hard enough without extra. So in terms of responsiveness, if your application requires sub one second time response times, then engineer for that. Don't engineer for sub 100 microsecond response times. And the closer, honestly, that your sub one second response times get to your one second requirement, the more you're able to trade off simplicity of the software and its associated data structures, simplicity of the overall architecture and design, reliability, blah, blah, for meeting but not dramatically exceeding the required responsiveness target. And these are all like that. The security requirement is a requirement that's absolutely something you should think about in every project is what are my security requirements? And that should be done earlier. It should be done during the requirements phase. And once you understand what your security requirements are, which are usually thought about in terms of what's called a threat model, what kinds of things are you, do you expect, how do you expect to be attacked and what you need to protect from in those attacks. 
then engineer a system suitable to stop the threat to handle the threat model don't go above and beyond uh you don't have time to do it you don't have the resources to do it you probably don't have the expertise to be extra in security so just do good security figure out what you're worried about and all of these are like that figure out what your targets are for these illities for these extra functional requirements and treat them like other requirements make them something that where you figure out what you need a classic one is just plain old code quality uh, if you're building something that needs to go together really quickly and doesn't necessarily need to be super reliable or super super secure you may legitimately trade really bad code quality for quicker development and that may be that that may mean that you meet your requirement your deadline for development time and it may be that when you're done the security and reliability is good enough according to some metric you've set beforehand that's where you want to be so what's software design well it's the second thing in the engineering litany right what are we going to build? This is phase two is requirements. Phase two is how are we going to build it? And that's one of the first questions we have to answer. And a lot of how are we going to build it is standardized. A lot of it we will figure out as we go along. You know, if you're building a bridge, you probably don't have to figure out how your rivets are going to work most of the time. You're just going to assume that you can rivet the bridge together and you can figure out at a later stage where the rivets go and what specific kind of rivets you're going to use. Because you've built a lot of bridges with rivets before and this is just another one. In the same way, software systems like this are going to have a lot of sort of deferrable stuff, which is the stuff that as far as design of subsystems and that sort of thing, which is the stuff that Scrum and other Agile methods thrive on. But they're also going to have some very high level decisions that are going to be important and that are going to be hard and expensive to walk back. They'll require a lot of rework. Now, having said that, let me be really clear that in my opinion, over architecting is one of the few things in software that we consistently do over. There's a bunch of people who like to think of themselves as software architects and are very excited about how to architect the system and how these top layers should be built. Most of the time, our architecture should be brutalist. It should be made out of the obvious cement. It should be absolutely do the thing that looks like it's gonna bolt the stuff together. It's really really easy to get clever and go overboard a few times i've gotten clever in situations where it seemed appropriate and it's worked out fine but most of the time i've never tried to get clever because again it just makes things harder for no gain so a lot of software design architecture is don't overdo architecture remember is strategy detailed design is tactics so it's sort of a multi-level thing we're not going to just have one level of how are we going to build this, right? This is a very complex artifact. How are we going to build it overall? How are we going to build these pieces? How are we going to build the pieces of the pieces? What programming languages are we going to use? What hardware interfaces do we need? All these questions are their own questions. And as we go from what's the overall shape of the software down this sort of design stack, we eventually end up with pseudocode, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. So one of the important ideas, and this is one of the things that Scrum and other Agile methods are actually pretty good at, is this idea of traceability. The idea of traceability is that I should know why elements are in my design in terms of the requirements. That is, it's really easy to pick an architecture and start build, sticking blocks into that architecture without thinking too much about why they're there other than this is the foo architecture and I'm very familiar with the foo architecture so we will build the foo architecture. That's usually a way to get very overcomplicated, very overbloated designs which are going to translate into very overcomplicated, very bloated code and you don't want that. Similarly, I should be able to trace the design that I come up with to the code. I should be able to answer for the code that's in the system. Why is it 
in there? What part of the design does this code serve? And this business with keeping Kanban boards and uh, story cards and that kind of stuff, part of what it's about is that we're supposed to be keeping track of what we're doing by sort of inputting and outputting these small chunks of work and that helps us stay focused on the idea that we don't do things that aren't directly related to what needs doing and that's a really important idea of agile it was really easy even in well-run incremental iterative waterfall software projects it's really easy to spend a lot of time in the architecture phase of design being very clever and fancy and build a thing that a is way extra in terms of meeting the requirements and b is way extra in terms of code to actually get it implemented. Now, how do you learn this? And this is the problem. Here's how you learn it, honestly, is you build software systems at all different scales for 20 years. This is even more than team leads and that sort of thing. This is a job that in industry traditionally was done by someone very experienced who'd been in the business a long time and had done a lot of this work before these days teams trend young there's a lot of ageism in the business and a lot of very bright 20 somethings are being put in the business of being software architects and frankly in my opinion that's part of why we have a lot of interesting architectural issues a big part of it is that we have people who don't have enough experience to have good taste or good judgment or good good knowledge about how to do architectural design you need to look at a lot of other people's designs how did you build the system you know for some systems of all different sizes and all different domains one of the most constructive things you can do if you're trying to learn how to be a designer is to look at the design decisions other people made and try to understand where they came from. Sometimes you will identify bad design decisions, then try to understand the root causes of those because that can be useful. More often you'll be identifying good design decisions and trying to understand the root rationale of those. It's really helpful to look at other people's stuff when learning design. There's a lot of material out there. There's the whole Gang of Five Software Patterns book. There's all kinds of things out there um, where people have written down their ideas about how systems are architected and how they should be architected. <sighs> Again, I, every time I try to read that stuff, I find myself thinking, wow, that's way more complicated than I normally would need to think about. And so you got to take some of it with a grain of salt, but it is out there and it is a way to learn. So we have architecture. We also have detailed design. So the architecture, like I said, is the strategy. It's the overall sort of block diagram. What am I building? Is this thing going to be a pipeline? Am I going to structure it client server? Is it going to be a piece of software that has plugins that do most of the work? Do I process files that contain some kind of information? Is a database at the heart of it? Is a GUI at the heart of it? Is the web there? Is the network there? Sort of what at the top level does this thing work like? A typically a good format for thinking about the architecture is in a white paper of a couple or three pages describing the architecture, maybe five pages describing the architecture. That's one of those things where Agile doesn't really do that so much, but Agile doesn't have actually very good advice about how to do design. I would say that for that Agile is probably the worst thing that design is probably the worst thing that Agile does. Agile is not set up to do design very well. It's great for implementation and great for testing, but design is hard for it. So we, one of the things we got to watch out for is the design constraints. Uh, both how is the design constrained by the requirements and also how does the design constrain the implementation and tests uh, we want to leave we want the design to leave room for the implementers and the testers the QA people to work happily <coughs> a design that's hard to implement and hard to test is probably a bad design even if it's otherwise cool because probably you didn't need to go there and 
probably people downstream are going to be unhappy. Again, minimal architecture that fits the requirements. Keep things as simple as you can. Once you've got an overall design, once you've got an overall block diagram describing what you're building, you go on through layers of design down toward detailed design. We're going to decompose the design down into pieces, and then we'll architect those pieces and decompose them. And ideally, in a fantasy waterfall project, your design's all the way down to units. You describe the procedures, functions, methods, etc., that are going to be built in your software. Now, of course, in an agile approach, you probably don't do that, but you at least want to break it down far enough that you can start getting cards that tell you pieces that you need to implement. And until you start getting implementable, directly implementable cards, you probably haven't broken it down enough. There's an old hu rule of human attention to objects. And the rule says seven plus or minus two. That is, depending on circumstances and people, you can get anywhere between five and nine things that you keep in your head at once. That's sort of the limit on how many things you can keep in short-term processing at the same time as a human being in a project. And so that's a good rule to keep in mind, right? Nine at most, five is better sort of pieces at each layer. And the whole point of hierarchical decomposition and layering is to defer complexity, and that way you can have a reasonable size thing going on. Now, there's sort of two schools of design at the detail level. One is to sort of do bottom up. That's not very much in fashion in sort of fancy people circles, but it is the way I build a lot of systems. Bottom up design would be first I figure out what my interfaces look like at the bottom of the, of the technology stack. First I figure out what services I need to provide that are going to be pure services for the rest of the architecture. I, I design and build those and then I start thinking about how I can build the next pieces on top of that. That can be wasteful because you can end up building things that you never actually use. On the other hand, it does mean that by the time you're done with that, you have a pretty good idea of how to do the next layer up. The other approach that's sort of favored in academic circles is the more top-down approach that I've described to you. You start with an architecture, you break it down into pieces, and eventually you get to the bottom and figure out how things are gonna hook up. That has its own set of problems because it's really easy to design yourself into a situation where you don't find until very late that your design is essentially unimplementable or implementable only with great difficulty for reasons you hadn't anticipated yet. The obvious answer, in the words of the late Stan Kelly Boodle and others, is middle out. <laughs> you know, clearly we should start from the middle and work toward both ends. That'll dodge, yeah. There's no great way, no perfect way to do it but you should be thinking all the time about what the relationship is between the high level architecture at the top of the design stack and the low level units that sit at the bottom of the design stack. Again, simpler is better. Don't be any cleverer than you have to be. So I mentioned layers. There's this idea that your design often is layered from sort of back-end or bottom-end primitive services to front-end or top-end user-facing services. And the book talks about, our textbook for the course talks some about this and points out some of the issues there, of which there are quite a bunch. Layers are a good way often to think about software more than they're a good way to implement software. And certainly the fewer layers you have, the more likely your software is to be simple and understandable and easy to build. And so you don't want to layer too much, but sometimes a layer is necessary. So you want to figure out how to not have too many layers so that things get complicated and weird and the layers get in each other's way. But you really want to paper over things sometimes with layers or you're going to have problems. So again, it's just a matter of taste. You'll learn how to do it over time. The book 
takes client server as an example of an architecture because it's a very popular architecture right now. The idea here is that I have some kind of application that works on a shared data source, perhaps a database, perhaps files, perhaps whatever, and has to do some processing on that data. And we pick a machine or machines for that backend cloud stuff and put stuff there. And then on the front end, we can put a cli clients of that service. So we build the software as a service and the, you know, the backend is a service and we build the user interface and the high level manipulation code as a client of that service, a thing that uses that service to do work. And that's a pretty common architecture and has been for 40 or 50 years. It's one of the ones that you should be thinking about as you start to design systems. It's not the only architecture there is, but it is a useful architecture. And notice that, you know, the traditional formulation of this has the back end over the internet somewhere on a cloud and the front end sitting in the user's workspace. That's not a necessity. I've built a lot of client server systems where the client and the service, clients and the service literally share memory. They sit in threads in the same program. And that can be a really nice architecture even for programs that are like that. So, you know, one of the things to get away from is this idea that specific architectures are implemented in specific ways. That isn't really how you think about it. Architectures are shapes of software. And this software where, uh, the shape where a service is consumed by multiple clients simultaneously, that's a pretty common shape and a pretty powerful one. The book talks about model view controller as a thing related to client server, which it definitely is. I would take the book's comments about model view controller with a grain of salt. They have chosen to talk about one of many versions of model view controller model view controller mvc as we call it is one of these patterns that everybody likes to talk about and everybody likes to pretend that whatever they use is this is a pattern that originally came from small talk in the old old days and the small talk version doesn't look very much like the modern versions of this pattern a lot of times but it is useful to think about sort of three interacting pieces in a system. The model being the data that the system is manipulating or accessing. The view being the interface layer that presents that data or permits those manipulations in some sanitized way that doesn't depend on the details of the underlying stuff. And the controller being the thing that works with the view and the model, you know, that with the model to change the model and with the view to provide access to it. And MVC is cool. There are whole books written about it. But again, the book's description is a little simplistic, so be a little careful with it. There's a section called technology issues in this chapter of our course text. Please ignore it. It's full of things. Um, I think there's a lot of very questionable advice in there. There's some interesting th sort of looks at hot takes on how things are in the industry or how they were at one point. In particular, the section on open source is a very strange framing of the open source argument, which sounds like it's from 15 years ago it doesn't sound current it doesn't sound really in any way in line with our understanding of how open source works anymore if you want to know more about that i'm happy to talk with you about it at some point so that's software design in a largish nutshell in the old days the end one of the end products of the design stage would be pseudocode. And I want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about pseudocode and what it is and why you might want to do it. I personally think it's one of the most ridiculously underused and powerful tools that a software developer has in their repertoire. 
and I would encourage you to try some of it and I think trying some of it will eventually make you excited to try more of it look you pick a unit that has interesting stuff going on and it. it's not just reading data from one place and writing it to another but it actually has to compute a thing it actually has to do a thing it actually has to interact in interesting ways with things those kind of interactions are really easy to get wrong and the mistake we make as designers is we don't get specific enough about how to get them right excuse me and pseudocode is a tool for being very specific about what you want the implementation to look like the idea of pseudocode is that it's not code you can't compile it you can't run it but it should be a thing that's every line of pseudocode should be one to five lines of code it should be very close to being code and it should be in english and as clear of an english as you can write and you omit super easy details you don't need to get all the types right or anything like that and the idea here is to have a pretty detailed description sort of a teleprompter so that i can sit down to code this thing and read off the pseudocode and type very very fast correct code in because i've thought about things carefully in the pseudocode it's a really super powerful technique if you've you've taken an algorithms class or if you do take an algorithms class you'll see that the world of algorithms works pretty much entirely in pseudocode you'll see very little real code in an algorithms course because real code is too low a level of detail to be easily read and written it captures the specifics of languages in a way that isn't very interesting from an algorithm's point of view working one level up in the pseudocode space turns out to be a really good place to work so there's some thoughts about architecture and about software design take them for what they're worth uh, the easiest way to get a good design is to have a small piece of software to build this is one of those things where scaling software scales the difficulty of design very, very rapidly. And so I would encourage you to think hard about when you're having trouble with the design about, do I really need all this stuff in my software? Hopefully that was helpful. As always, thanks for listening. Really do stay safe and well out there. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.